everyone and welcome to Faces of Digital Health, originally a podcast about digital health and how healthcare systems around the world adopt technologies, but now also a YouTube channel. Today's discussion is one of the discussions that were recorded for the purpose of the movie Overdose, How Can We Prevent Medication Errors? You can find the movie on the YouTube channel, and uh, I also added the link in the show notes. But to share the full interviews with the speakers, you can listen today in this episode to Dr. David W. Bates, an MD from Harvard who is a patient safety expert and did a lot of research of the effects that computers and IT have on physicians. Various research papers show that 90 to 96% of alerts get overlooked by physicians. So in this discussion, you're going to hear why is medication prescribing challenging for physicians, what kind of errors are happening in the process, and why are current systems, IT systems, that physicians use, more often than not, still very frustrating. Dr. Bates is an authority in this field. He published over 700 peer-reviewed articles, so he's definitely got a lot of knowledge on the topic. Enjoy the show, see the documentary as well, and if you're interested in other topics as well, browse the YouTube channel or go to www.facesofdigitalhealth.com. Um, Dr. Bates, you've published over 700 peer-reviewed uh, papers. Can you tell me a little bit about your background? Why is patient safety important to you? How did you get into this field? Sure, I'm, I'm a general internist, so I take care of, uh, of patients uh, who, with all different sorts of problems. And my research interests have focused uh, largely on, on patient safety. When I trained, it wasn't that obvious to me that patient safety was a big problem. I knew that there were some issues. But when I started doing my research training, uh, there, were, there was a very important study that was published uh, which came out of, of uh, Harvard where I was doing my fellowship. And that study showed that, uh, that harm related to the care that was given was actually much more frequent than, uh, than people had thought. And much of it was related to medications. So, so that was really the thing that kind of got me started in, in the area that I work in. Did you ever experience uh, yourself, you know, in your clinical practice, uh, like an occurrence of medication-related errors? Do you have any examples that you could per perhaps share? Yes, there was one uh, instance which really had a big effect on me, and it was when I was training, and I was uh, taking care of a patient, and he came in, and we were told that his uh, high blood pressure was very severe and they'd done as much as they could to control it outside the hospital, but they just hadn't been able to control it. And uh, uh, he was on a lot of medications. I was at the time uh, working with a medical student who was training to be an intern. We call them a sub-intern. And the medical student went over the medications with the patient and there was one medication, which is a very strong medication for, for uh, lowering the blood pressure. And it came in two dosages. Uh, one was two and a half milligrams, the other was 20 milligrams. And uh, because this patient had had very hard to control high blood pressure, we, we incorrectly assumed that he was taking the higher of those two dosages. And when we gave him that uh, medication, his blood pressure actually immediately dropped to w way below um, what what was expected, and he had a small heart attack. And that was a really uh, upsetting instance for me. Um, I, I you know I kind of couldn't believe that we had not worked out exactly what the dosage of his medication had been, and. You know, we had tried, but we obviously just did not get it correct. It seems to me like that's the sort of thing that the medical system should always know. And that case uh, really upset me and stuck with me. So how big of a problem is medication-related safety 
today. We've got new technological uh, solutions that are trying to support and prevent errors, but how far have we come? Can we talk about any numbers? Sure. Um, I mean, it's it's still a big problem. When the Harvard Medical Practice Study was done, uh, medication safety was the single largest cause of harm, um, although there there are many others. Now, since that time, we've made many changes that have improved medication safety. Uh, so, for example, drugs are now prescribed using the computer, and and the prescriptions can be checked for problems like the dosages and and uh, how often they should be given, and and uh, you know many things like that. In addition, when medications are given to patients, they're all barcoded in most in most developed countries, and uh, so then you can verify that exactly the right medication is being given. And there are additional checks when the medication is actually administered uh, to the patient. Uh, with all of that, we think we've made a reasonably big difference in terms of medication safety. Maybe it's decreased by half, but we also have now many more medications, more potent medications, and the the problem still still exists. And much more work has been done inside the hospital than, than outside the hospital. And now people are spending more time outside the hospital and taking lots of medications outside the hospital that they only used to take inside the hospital. So uh, bottom line, it's still a big problem. Okay, so if I understand correctly, the problem somehow transfers a little bit in the outpatient setting because now patients are... Um, basically taking a lot of medications in an uncontrolled environment at their home. Correct. For example, in, in cancer chemotherapy, we used to admit people to the hospital all the time if they were going to get uh, intensive uh, chemotherapy. Now much more of that is done outside the hospital. And often the patient themselves is in charge of deciding exactly how much to take. If you take too big a dose of your chemotherapy, uh, that can that can cause really serious serious problems. Uh, similarly, we now have a lot of immunosuppressive drugs, which are which are very good for treating uh, a lot of diseases like like Crohn's disease and multiple sclerosis, for example. Uh, but they also can cause a really serious uh, illness if they if they are not used correctly or if the patient takes too much of them. And in, in the clinical practice, you know, from the physician's perspective, how do you see uh, medication management today? So on the one hand, there's more decision support systems, but there's also more therapies, more complex therapies. The prescribing and the treatments are getting more personalized. So how do, do, do the, these two things go together? Yeah, th there's, there, there's a lot of work to be done in that regard. Um, the systems that we have today are pretty good at checking uh, when a patient, when a doctor wants to give a, a patient a medication, that uh, that it is uh, um, the right medication, that it uh, that it d doesn't interact too badly with the other medications the patient is taking. Um, some systems suggest doses; most don't. Um, you know, what the systems still don't do uh, is suggest for a given patient what the best medication is. And diabetes is a condition, for example, for which we now have some really powerful new treatments. Um, but it's very hard for doctors to keep up with all those treatments and to figure out for an individual patient, you know, what is the next best medication for you? That's, that's really hard. And that's what I think uh, one of the next big things will be in, uh, in improving medication care broadly and medication safety in particular. So as a physician, what would you wish that technology would offer you in support to improving medication safety? Uh, well, I, I, would, I would like a couple of things. I would like some help uh, picking the best medication for, for an individual patient based on all their characteristics like their their age and their gender and their kidney function and their weight and, and so on. Um, um, and, and I would also like the system to check for problems with, with that medication and let me know only when the 
a really important uh, problem is identified. One of the problems with today's systems is they're warning physicians all the time. And uh, physicians are getting tired of getting uh, all these alerts. They're getting alerted often when there's not really a problem. And when you deal with a system like that, you start to you start to ignore the alerts. So there's a very big need to clean up the uh, the alerts that are being given currently. Uh, what do the statistics say? So what does the research say in terms of the numbers um, of medication related errors that still happen or have been decreased? Anything that's currently known? Sure. Uh, well, some of the work that we did showed that that when you uh, just computerize uh, ordering of medications, you can reduce the frequency of medication errors by around 80%. So, so pretty big decrease. Um, with barcoding, you can reduce the chance of giving somebody the wrong medication to to near zero. Barcoding really, really works well. Uh, but if you look at it. Uh, from the other angle, uh, what does it feel like to be a physician? Uh, physicians are now getting, uh, uh, at our hospital, one warning for every two medications that they write, and people write medications all the time, and they're overriding 98% of those warnings. So it's very clear that to us that we need to uh, decrease the frequency of those warnings because we've also found that e even when there's a really important warning, people are very likely to to ignore it or, or override it. A again, just because they're getting so many, so many warnings and it's hard to sort out what's really important from what's not. To which extent do you think that in the future, uh, the decision support systems could potentially take over too much of the cognitive uh, burden, you know, that physicians have to put in prescribing? Yeah, that's a, a, a good question. I, I I think that they're not going to take over uh, entirely. I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, it's like, uh, in many ways, uh, flying a plane. Uh, the planes that, that people are flying today are vastly safer than they were in the past, but the pilot is still making the calls and, and, and flying the, the, uh, the plane. So I, I think it will, it will, uh, be like that. Um, there have been some instances in which uh, you get to very high levels of safety. For example, in radiotherapy, uh, the levels of safety are, are, are now very, very high. The machines make a lot of suggestions. And uh, even when the suggestion that the machine is making is wrong, the- I can't hear you at the moment, so I'm not sure if something's wrong with your microphone. Hmm, uh, I think, can you hear me now? Um, oh, right. Okay. I think it's, can you say something? Sure. Okay. Yeah, I now? think it's good now. Yeah. So let's, uh, sorry about that. Um, can we just repeat? Uh, sure. The, can you start from the beginning? Yeah. Yeah. Um, let, let's see. This this question was about, oh, so, so uh, you know, within in areas where we, they've gotten to a high, very high level of safety, like radiotherapy, um, um, you know, what they've found is that the radiotherapists get so used to the machine being correct that even when it makes a mistake, uh, they they often uh, feel like it has to be correct because it's correct so much of the time. So, so that's an instance in which there have been some really serious uh, injuries that have been caused by, by uh, clinicians putting too much trust in the machine. We're a, w a long ways from that with respect to medication safety today, I would say. Um, I've asked you, we, we've been through this a little bit over the discussion, but still you've done a lot of research uh, about the uh, usefulness of uh, decision support systems and um, IT in the clinical practice. So I wonder uh, what do you see as the most promising and the most problematic parts of these solutions? Yeah, well, just computerizing the process of prescribing makes makes a huge difference. For one thing, you don't have the problem of handwriting anymore. And uh, we've showed that when you do computerize the process, it reduces the error rate an enormous amount. Now, to really get a lot of clinical benefit, you have to layer on top good uh, clinical decision support. 
um, and that's decision support that makes suggestions when they're needed, but doesn't make them when they're when they're not needed. And and uh, so so that I think is uh, is really you know what we need to continue to work on to get to the to the next level. Um, and what about the the benefits, perhaps? Okay, yeah, so basically you mentioned that, but like, okay, so what about some of the issues that are introduced due to technology, such as the one that we mentioned that patients can unintentionally over rely on technology? Mm -hmm. So, so that's that's uh, a concern too. Uh, and any time you introduce a new technology. Uh, it will uh, create some new errors, and it's very important to to look for those and and monitor, and then make changes to the to the technology to uh, to try and 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 get rid of them. And it uh, it's really a new frontier, uh, giving patients uh, a lot of this technology that that for example they can use at home. Um, I'm quite optimistic, for example, that that apps will be very helpful for, for patients in managing many of their chronic diseases like like uh, diabetes. Uh, but you also just have to be very careful when you're making uh, specific suggestions to a patient. For example, if you're telling a diabetic how much insulin uh, to take and they, they take too much, um, that, you know, that is, is, a, is a dangerous thing. So areas like that are, are regulated more tightly. Uh, uh, than say uh, a wellness app which helps you exercise more and and lose weight that kind of thing because because that's uh, you know relatively safer you mentioned before that the introduction of technology causes a certain level of new burden to the clinicians in the clinical practice and we see that uh, clinicians often complain about these systems either they fear that they're not going to do something right, um, that the system is going to break because of them, or that um, the, or the Wi-Fi is not working correctly, or some other systemic glitches that happen that basically um, prevent, for example, a nurse to administer a medication to the patient because something is not allowing her to do so. So, you know, from that perspective, what does the research show about the effect of this kind of issues on the clinical work and um, also on, on medication safety? Yeah, the, what the evidence is, is very compelling that medication safety is, is much greater if you're using technology. And I sometimes you know, use use an analogy here of what it's like to to fly a plane. In aviation, uh, things are are vastly safer than they were, uh, you know, 20 years ago before they were using all these instruments and and had as many safety checks in place. Um, and I you know think about getting onto a plane, and uh, you're about to fly. If you looked over to the cockpit and saw that the pilot had no instruments, uh, how would you how would you feel about that? Uh, pilots uh, have instruments that go go wrong and create problems all the time, and and doctors do too. Um, uh, so I guess what I would say is, even though people sometimes complain about these things, um, the net is you know much higher levels of safety. But but we're you know nowhere near where aviation is in this this regard. We have to we have to make our our uh, tools and decision support work much, much better than it does uh, today. There's there's a lot of room for improvement. And that's basically where we come to the design of the solutions. And perhaps a comment or maybe what the, have you found out in the research regarding uh, that topic? So how could solutions be designed differently to offer more than they do? Sure. The, there are principles of, of design which are very helpful in uh, designing solutions that will result in the in the desired action. It's a, there's a whole field of human-centered uh, design, and uh, it's actually required that uh, organizations that are building decision support and electronic records uh, utilize human-centered design when they develop their their tools. But if you look at carefully at at uh, how they've actually done things, uh, many of them do not do that. They, they don't follow uh, a, a lot of the, the rules for design. And uh, 
uh, that predictably results in solutions that don't work as well as they should. Um, uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Raj Ratwani, who's at MedStar in, in Washington, D.C., has, has done a lot of this. And he found of nine major uh, health IT vendors that they evaluated, uh, something like only three or four really utilized uh, user-centered design well, and many of the others uh, uh, either didn't use it at all or or said they did, but they didn't didn't really employ it. And if you look at the usability characteristics of the leading healthcare IT vendors, uh, they they are just not very good. Um, if you if you want to look at at you know what a, a really good design is, for example, Google uh, just the Google search uh, tool gets very high ratings. An example of a technology that people use regularly that does not is Excel. Uh, Microsoft Excel is is quite hard to use, and that gets uh, uh, fairly low ratings. But the ratings of most of the healthcare IT systems are around the level of Excel or or below it. Um, so so there's just a lot of work to do in terms of designing things in ways that are easier for people to use. How do you think that uh, impacts the whole uh, area of patient and medication safety because in the article that was kind of reviewing the 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 two Aries human um, uh, kind of uh, documents 20 years later, um, one of the findings is, and it's quite an obvious one, that, you know, you can have the best software in theory, but if it's not used correctly, then it's not going to bring the benefits. And it kind of alludes to the importance of support and training and very non-technical sides of technology adoption and introduction. Yeah. Um, well, um, th I, think, I think support is, a, is a very, very important. Um, I think training is sometimes overrated. I mean, if software is poorly designed, it's hard to train people enough to, to have them use it effectively. And uh, um, so, so I think, you know, this support and, and is really probably more important than, than training personally. You should, you should uh, have some training, but, but if software is really good and really well designed, you don't need a lot of, of, uh, of training. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of the benefit uh, comes from, from how the, the, these tools are designed. And, and if you then uh, look at how they perform and iteratively make changes to them, they, they, will, uh, they will get better. Um, I think we haven't been as good at making iterative changes as we as we probably need to be and you know in, in the u.s we just went through uh, a major change so the government uh, made available uh, a large large sums of money and uh, and organizations uh, you know got that money if they adopted systems and we had very rapid adoption across the whole country of commercial applications um, so the incentives to the vendors in that situation were uh, to get the get the systems out there and get people to use them, and that's what they're doing. Now we're in a different period. We need to refine those systems and make them work better for for people, and that's that's taking some time. When it comes to design and medication safety. One kind of non-technical thing is also the design of medications. For example, there was just a case where a patient received six doses of the COVID vaccine because the nurse that was administering it um, thought that the vial that she used was already diluted because the way the vaccine is uh, packaged is that there's six doses in one vial. So I don't know, maybe do, do you have a comment in that regard, you know, in how many mistakes happen because the packages of medications are too uh, similar and yet yeah, there's new technologies such as robotics technology and uh, cabinets and barcoding that are kind of trying to mitigate that. So maybe you can kind of uh, comment or tell a story around that uh, in your own words. Sure, that's cer certainly a factor. Um, and. And the safest thing is to use single-dose packaging uh, because 
then it, it just is much harder to, uh, to make a mistake. Um, there are a number of cases in which, which there were uh, things that happened uh, like this that, you know, that, that were even um, much worse. And, and the one that really comes to mind is that um, it relates to concentrated potassium, which is a very uh, dangerous um, uh, chemical because if you, if you give too much of it, it can stop the heart. And organizations around the country uh, used to have vials of concentrated potassium, and then they would have people dilute it and then and then give it to patients. But there were every, every year in the U.S. there were 30 or 40 deaths when someone uh, was planning to dilute the concentrated potassium but forgot to do so and, and then injected it into someone and and they died. Um, the safest thing is uh, is not to have really strong concentrates uh, sitting sitting around. For, for any reason, because humans are, are inherently uh, fallible, and and uh, and so that that's that's one kind of relatively simple approach for for avoiding uh, catastrophic cases like that. Uh, one question that I was also thinking about when um, kind of doing a mind map of this topic was that. For example, in the case I mentioned, you know, when a patient received six doses of the COVID vaccine, uh, she's obviously now being observed, but for the moment, she seems to be fine. And when it comes to medication-related errors, uh, you know, oftentimes they wouldn't really cause patient harm or at least not too much patient harm. So what's your kind of opinion about that? Um, does that make it uh, so the whole topic a little less worrisome because there's only a small percentage perhaps of really, really dangerous or fatal mistakes? Yeah, uh, th there are plenty of pa patients who are harmed by medications. And uh, you're right in that the chances that any individual medication error will result in an injury are, are relatively low. Um, the number of injuries, because we use so many medications, is is actually um, um, pretty high. Um, we we found that the the chance of any individual medication error resulting in an adverse drug event is about one in a hundred. Um, so so that might seem like a, a a low number, but the thing is, people take so many medications that that there are a lot of adverse drug events. My approach in research has mostly been to, to count the adverse drug events or numbers of, numbers of injuries due to drugs because um, uh, those are all things that, that people care about. And, and we care about medication errors too. But uh, as you pointed out, um, sorry about that. <laughs> but, but as you pointed out, the, the chance of... of uh, being harmed by any individual uh, error is is relatively low. So I guess that's that's um, kind of uh, reassuring in a way. It is. It is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so w one thing I was also wondering was um, we managed to achieve, and it's possible to achieve a reduction in patient harm with safer prescribing, uh, thanks to new approaches, thanks to the awareness about the meaning of patient safety, um, thanks to technology. Uh, but to which extent do you think that mistakes can be eliminated? Should we just accept the fact that it's not possible to prevent all errors? What's your aspect on the amount of harm that can be prevented? Yeah, this is a big debate in the safety community, and many in the safety community have, have argued that we should have a target of zero harm. And I, I think that's uh, never going to be attainable. Uh, there's there's some parts of, of medicine where we should be able to get rid of nearly all, uh, nearly all errors and nearly all injuries. And an example would be in giving patients the wrong medication. If we have all medications barcoded and people check the barcode every time, the chances of giving somebody the wrong medication are, are very low. There have been some catastrophic injuries uh, 
uh, that have been, and deaths that that have been caused by situations like that. So a classic example is when um, adult strength heparin is put in the in the uh, neonatal uh, intensive care unit, so where where there are a lot of babies, and if you give a baby a dose of adult strength heparin, they predictably will die. Um, there was one uh, hospital in Ohio in which which that happened, and three babies died before they figured out what was going on. Uh, finally, when the third baby died, they they realized that that there there was a there was concentrated heparin that was being given to these. Uh, to these uh, children, and the, the you know an issue there is that the vials look very similar. So just looking at the vial, you you wouldn't necessarily notice anything. So there's been a lot of work to try and make things uh, um, look different. Uh, there are other areas of of uh, safety in which I think it's it's harder to uh, to you know make make a big difference. We'll be able to make things safer, but we aren't going to be able to eliminate all harm. Uh, in in aviation, uh, the, if the if the weather is really horrible, they just don't fly. Uh, but there are times in medicine when somebody's really sick, you have to do an operation on them. And uh, some of my friends who are pilots have likened some of the things that, that we do, say in surgery, to flying a plane upside down in a storm. You just wouldn't do that in in a, in a commercial aviation. Uh, um, so, you know, um, I, I think we can make things a lot safer than they are today, but I don't think we'll ever get to, to, uh, to zero harm. You led the WHO International Multi-Stakeholder Priority Working Group to identify a set of global priorities for patient safety research. And the interesting thing to me there was that um, adverse drug events and medications rank 10th, but the top three are very human factor centered. So lack of communication and coordination, latent organizational failure, failures, poor safety culture and blame oriented processes. Can you perhaps briefly talk about these points in light of medication related patient safety? Sure, and th those are all uh, overarching things, and they are all all uh, really imp really important. So let me start with uh, lack of, of coordination and communication. Um, delivering good medical care is inherently very uh, coordination and communication intensive. Uh, but in the hospital today, uh, we'll often have uh, four or five different uh, teams seeing w one patient. And for them to all stay on the same page about what's going on with the patient and what they want to do is uh, is very hard, and that frankly, you know, does not work as well as it as it should. Um, similarly, when uh, somebody's been in the hospital and then they go home, uh, often the the information that's that's given from the person taking care of them in the hospital to to the person who's caring for them later is uh, is not as good as it should be. Um, so there, there are many instances like that where we need to uh, work on putting in place better uh, communication. I think that can be done with, with technology. So for example, uh, patients now uh, in the US have a personal health record and anytime they're discharged from the hospital, a whole set of information about what happened to them is sent directly to the person who's caring for them at home. And that, you know, is, is somebody, I'm somebody who does care for them at home. That's enormously useful to have. You want to know what happened in the hospital and what, what changes have been made. Um, uh, but, you know, there's, there's lots of work uh, to do there. In terms of uh, latent organizational failures, those, those are uh, common issues too. Um, um, the problem there is... Uh, that there are multiple different uh, services, for example, taking care of patients, and we don't coordinate as as well as we should. Uh, actually, you know, between between those services, and it's closely related to lack of coordination. So, so one example would be uh, nursing and and doctors uh, communicating. Um, we we don't have as good approaches as we as we should around that. Again, I think there are technological uh, uh, solutions to that. We Set, set something up uh, in which 
when a patient's in the hospital, uh, we set up what, uh, what's called a microblog, which lets the uh, everyone who's caring for the patient on the team uh, talk about what's going on with that patient uh, in a relatively informal way. And that's, that's a way for everybody to get on the same page. Um, safety culture is a big issue in many institutions. It varies a lot from country to country as to uh, how much it's an issue. Um, it's something that we've worked on pretty intensively in the US. Um, and, and here the, the key is um, to, to move towards a, a blame-free approach. So the old approach was if somebody made a mistake, uh, they would just be blamed or, or punished for it. And uh, the fact is that most uh, people in healthcare systems uh, really want to do a good job. They're doing their best. Uh, some mistakes are inevitable. And blaming the person who made the error uh, is not is not helpful. Um, but um, it's easy for a leader when, when something serious goes wrong to just point their finger at the person who made the mistake. And, uh, and and you know, and then scapegoat them. And if you do that, it really uh, makes culture much worse. So uh, we, uh, for example, um, measure our safety culture in an ongoing way. We work on it. We find that there are pretty big differences, uh, even from from uh, a unit to unit in hospitals. Much of that uh, depends on the the local leadership. Um, and uh, that I think will, will is an ongoing process. But we now we now have a, a approaches for measuring it, uh, tools for for uh, uh, helping people um, um, you know build build the strong safety culture, and um, and you know that that is a place in which we've really made I would say a lot of progress. Um, I'm the editor of the Journal of Patient Safety. We get articles from all over the world. And when we get articles from places like Iran, um, their their levels of safety culture are are very low. There's it's still the routine thing, in in uh, you know in in many uh, countries um, like that to to uh, uh, blame people. And there have not has not been as much system, uh, systematic work to to try and change that. And it takes a long time. It probably took ten or twenty years. In the states to change it, and it and still, you know, uh, how much that has changed is very uneven. If you go to some small hospitals, uh, there may may still be a blame-oriented uh, approach. So that's that's a long-term thing that needs to be addressed in healthcare. Leadership is very important in changing the culture, which is very resistant to change. So perhaps as a last question, what? Uh, advice, message, or what good examples of uh, change could you perhaps mention, you know, how, what's the best approach in trying to change the culture? Well, I think it's critical for leaders to learn about patient safety and learn about patient sa safety culture and what it takes to um, maintain uh, good safety culture. There's some terrific examples of how organizations responded to even very serious uh, accidents in ways that were were positive. Uh, one of those is, was one, uh, um, sadly, that I was uh, involved with because it happened in an institution here. Um, uh, Betsy Lehman was the healthcare reporter for the Boston Globe, uh, and she was admitted to the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. and uh, because of a miscalculation, she got five times too much chemotherapy and eventually died of, of uh, uh, as a result of that. And the institution uh, took that took that accident and uh, learned a great deal from it and really uh, changed many of their processes. And I, I, I applaud the the leadership at the at the Dana Farber for all that they did uh, around that. Um, that's an example of an organization that, that really transformed it, its culture and the level of safety at the institution, um, at, you know, after there was a serious accident. Uh, we don't want every institution around the world to have to have a serious accident before they they go through this and work on it. So, so I think it's one of the most important things for healthcare leaders uh, to learn about is, uh, is this area of 
you know, both safety and quality, uh, what it takes to improve it, and how they can ha they can have an influence on making things better. Dr. Bates, thank you. Um, that's basically all the questions that I have. You certainly opened up a few um, interesting and important topics in regards to the patient safety. So hopefully in the future, we will uh, get closer to zero harm. Yeah, thank you. I, I think that I think that's uh, uh, entirely possible. And it's my fervent hope that we'll, we will get there.